please welcome this morning Emily Zoe Major. Hello, do. It's so good to be here. It's fantastic. Standing in front of all these sparkling minds is very inspiring. So thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is Emily Zoe Baker and I am a poet. It's what I do for a living. And when I stand in front of a room and tell them for the next 20 minutes they're going to be learning about poetry, this is generally the reaction I get. <laughs> People really hate poetry. <laughs> I don't know why exactly, but people do tell me that um, at high school they were kind of tortured by it. Um, it's very dry, very textbook, and it's delivered in a kind of uh, boring way. Uh, the textbooks are full of mainly dead white men and Dorothea McKellar, and that's it. And I think teaching poetry just from textbooks is like teaching about the ocean just using a glass of water. There's so much more to it than that. There's layers, there's depths, there's more colours than you could possibly imagine. So I think high school and school in general and sometimes life can kind of stomp it out of you a little bit. But I think a love of words is natural. It's language, it's part of who we are. And I think we're all born with poetry bouncing off our skin. And I know this because children are naturally really good poets. They see things that we don't see. They share jokes with animals. <laughs> <laughs> they perform... <laughs> <laughs> they perform... <laughs> I know it gets better! <laughs> and better! <laughs> they perform inconceivable unbelievable acts of beauty all the time and that is poetry there's this cool story I read in a book once um, about this mother she was uh, at the sink and she saw her little boy down the back of the yard and the, the boy was there shaking the hell out of his lilac tree <laughs> and, uh, and she's like oh she, she runs down there and her first instinct is of course to say stop it you know you're killing the tree um, but instead she asked him what he was doing and he said, Mama, I'm stirring the sky. <laughs> That's poetry right there. And I think so often we say stop or we say no to, to little kids or even to big kids or to teenagers or to adults when we should really be asking why, what are you doing? And to make that flourish because I think the more we do that, the more a creative, wonderful world with ideas and magic we will live in. I remember the exact moment, the exact moment I wanted to become a poet. I was 12 and the movie Mask had just come out, starring Cher. Do you remember this? <laughs> Take me to the 80s, said everybody. Yeah. Do you remember this? Yeah. Yeah? Some of you? Some, some of you probably never seen it. Okay, so, <laughs> so it, 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 was, it, was, it stars Cher, back when Cher was kind of cool and strong and not made of Botox and emoticons. She is today. Um, and it's a story about this boy named Rocky. And uh, he had this kind of facial deformity, like an elephantitis type thing. And it made his face look like he was wearing a mask. Hence the name of the movie Mask. Anyway, he falls in love with this blind girl played by Laura Dern. And Laura Dern can't see his mask, of course, but she like sees him, you know what I mean, without judgment. They fall madly in love. But her parents get upset because Eric Stoltz isn't a normal boy. And his mum's Cher gets all powerful in his defence and it's all teary and uplifting and my 12-year-old heart's stupidly beautiful. Anyway, there's this scene where Eric Stoltz is teaching the blind Laura Dern about colour. He demonstrates it. He hands her a hot meatball and he says, that is red. And then he gets some ice cubes and puts them in her hand and he says, that is blue. And then he gets some white cotton balls and he puts them in her hand and he says, Feel that that is white and she gives this big Laura Derny smile this oh my god you're teaching me about the world and it's so beautiful so. <laughs> and something stirred in me 12 years old I jolted upright and announced I want to teach colors to blind girls <laughs> I was so inspired 
inspired by words, meaning and understanding. I wanted to give the world synesthesia to change music into food, food into music. I wanted to colour smells, to paint the rain, to drink the sky. I wanted to make poetry. But as I got older, I realised that's not what people thought poetry was. <laughs> When I got to high school, it was something that was hidden in dusty books at the back of the library. It's something the teachers kind of wanted over and done with. And, uh, and it sort of like it was determined to be boring. And it didn't really like me either. It had a problem with me turning ice cream into jazz. It said, ice cream can't be jazz, Emily. D minus. <laughs> <laughs> me kind of knew that they were wrong. See, I thought, I thought poetry or the job of poetry was to unlock the universe like a safe. Each verse a combination and when applied correctly a door would swing open and the reader would get to walk into new worlds. Actually, sorry, that's the wrong slide. A door <laughs> would swing open. <laughs> And the reader would get to walk into unknown worlds where the human condition raged, where the beauty of misery was understood, where you could see inside death, make sense of tragedy, realise we're all in this together, one pulsating masterpiece drawn by the chaotic hand of nature. All the splendid horrors and magical coincidences of what it means to be alive. And I kind of thought, it applied to anything. Like the same way that Maya Angelou was a poet is the same way that Carl Sagan was a poet. The same way that Joan of Arc was a poet. The same way that Einstein was a poet. Growing up, I thought life was a messy, wonderful feast. And a poet was someone who danced on the table. But people kept telling me over and over again, no. <laughs> no. Uh -uh. no. Mm -mm. no. <laughs> they said poetry is not something you eat with your hands, it's not something you lick from your fingers, it doesn't spill down the front of your dress, it doesn't fall on your shoes or splash into your eyes, no, it is refined, picked up with an ivory toothpick, arranged in order like sushi. A real poet doesn't throw their words around like ribbons. A real poet irons and faultly, neatly folds their vocabulary. And I believed them. For ages I tried to be something I wasn't. Muffling my metaphors, suppressing my similes, breaking my lines like a back. <laughs> <laughs> Until I realised... Ah, uh, no, actually screw you guys. <laughs> I don't have to listen to your rules. No. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Poetry, to me, means the ultimate in freedom. It is the string between your head and your heart, and I wanted to ride it like a flying fox. It should help change and dazzle the way you see the world. And the way the world sees you, it should be inserted into conversation, given like medicine placed on the lips of politicians. It should be given its own damn TV show. It should be practiced like yoga for the imagination. It should start by teaching colours to blind girls and then bring music to the deaf, a forest to a jail cell, dreams to the sleepless. It is to imagine the impossible, to set fire to the ocean. It is to think, to ask questions, to put curiosity back into the hearts of humanity. The job of a poet is to be the messenger, to be nature's translator, to help decode God, to make sense of the senselessness. The job requires that you stand on your head and yell at a river, weep to Whitman, dance to Dylan, ride a bike naked in the forest. Pee in the woods. <laughs> Touch a stranger's hand on purpose. <laughs> Put your ear to the snow and listen. And ask 
the mountain's questions and then wait for their answer. And then write it all down. Pull it out of your mouth like a scarf from a clown. Let it be ridiculous, let it be stupid, let it be crazy, let it be wonderful. <laughs> write it, read it, put it in your pocket. Dance with it. I do it, I do it, do it, you do it, do it. Do it for love, do it for hope. Do it for the hope that it will turn your eyes into diamonds so you can see beauty in even the darkest of caves. I think it can be summed up entirely in this picture. What do you see here? Snow, tires, anything exciting? Obstacle course. Obstacle, oh, some season obstacle course. Okay. Penguins. Penguins, oh yeah, yeah, they're, it's kind of penguiny, isn't it? Not the most amazing picture, right? Kind of, you know, just tires and snow. I'm going to change the way you look at it with just two words. Are we ready? Let's go. Boom. Can you see that? Used rainbows. Boom. That's it. That's all you need to know about poetry right there. Um, I'm just going to show you this while I get ready for the next part of this. It's the halfway mark and um, this is an elephant dancing with a ribbon. Okay. <laughs> I want to perform a poem for you now. <laughs> this is a letter. I think all poems are letters. Letters to a universe that can't write back. And so this is a letter to a wish. Um, it's addressed to a rather large demographic. It's all the women that ever existed over the entire span of human history. <laughs> <laughs> so it should be. Okay. <laughs> Did all the women who ever existed over the entire span Ban of human history. I wish you knew I'm sorry. I wish I could apologise for like everything that you have been through, going right back. Starting with the woman whose heart was painted black with an apple in her hand. I want to scoop you up and whisper it into your ear. I wish that I was an enormous giant so I could gather you together, hold you close to my Kilimanjaro of a bosom and give you all your secrets back. To those ancient girls who were born under stars and hidden in caves. To those who were forced to keep their goddesses quiet, whose icons were stuffed away, their eternal ancestral flames stuffed out like cigarettes. I wish I could have tattooed your words on the hemisphere of my giant back so I could have kept your library safe. To the first slave women whose bodies were used to bear children they never got to see, whose spells were stomped on, whose language was ripped from their lips. To those taken from their warm homes and put on the backs of horses, forced onto ships and passed around like toys for grown men. I wish I could reach down with my arms as thick as the Milky Way and pull you from that pain. To all those who believed men when they said that women are wicked, evil creatures, or that they weren't allowed an opinion because they get their period, or it was their fault for what they were wearing, or they shouldn't have been out alone, or that they had it coming, or that God didn't love them if they didn't bear sons, or God didn't love them at all. I wish you didn't have to hear that. I wish my time-worn stone pillar fingers covered in moss could muffle your ears. To all those girls born disappointments, to those mothers who hated themselves and cursed their own bellies as a result, to those little ones forced down the aisle to stand with an old man, a cruel man, a heartless man, a loveless man, a violent man. I wish I could calm your panicked hearts, lift your veils and kiss your brows with my shoreline lips. To all those blamed for miscarriages who woke in the night screaming, their white sheets dyed red, their tears slapped from their faces, I wish you knew it wasn't your fault. To those left for war, widowed and abandoned, to those who believed themselves inferior, who were placed alone in the dark as an incubator for the heir of a king or for an heir with balls or for a billionaire businessman or for the man of the house because it can't be a house without one, I wish I could borrow the sun and light your darkened rooms. To all those whose love was called witchcraft, their hips told not to swing, their lips told not to part, their hands told not to hold, their tongues told never to be bold. To those who knew the ways of nature, who were blamed for terrifying weather, wars, murder and chaos, 
who stupefied priests who disobeyed and died screaming, shot with feathered pens, burnt with consecrated candles and hung with the string of their holy robes. I wish you knew they were scared. To those blank pages in history where these stories were never told, I wish I could bundle you together in my mountain range embrace, turn my veined rivers into ink and let you correct that wrong. To all those who gave birth without so much as a freaking Panadol, <laughs> or who became ill and were told it was a punishment, or who were kept in back rooms, distant towns, or basements. I wish I could rock you softly in my crescent moon cradle. To those treated so badly they themselves became cruel and infected entire bloodlines, I wish you epiphanies. To those little ones brought up in nunneries who were told their natural desires were a disease, their menstruations, the work of the devil who called it a monthly curse. I wish I could fill my salt lake heart with your tears and use it to baptize the ignorant. To those who lived in perpetual fear, whose eyes never once looked up, to those taken from a farmhouse to a palace against their will, whose fathers tried to hide them their beauty, their curse. To those who lived as prisoners in paradise, their faces hot with outrage. I wish I could scoop you up in the crystal lakes of my palms and let you float there to you. To anyone who spoke up about freedom or feminism, who started a revolution, who rallied, changed, created or fought, I wish I could encircle you with meteorites to deflect the slings and arrows that come your way. To the brave hearts who joined the army, only to be humiliated and belittled by their own peers, I wish I could encase you with the strongest metals from the earth and furnish you with unbreakable swords. To those who invented, wrote, designed or painted something spectacular only to have their husbands take credit. To those told not to drive a car because of hot flushes. Or that the vacuum cleaner was a revolutionary kind of freedom. <laughs> or who received the pill as a liberation but really just to make them more available, no strings attached, when free love turned out to be mostly about guys sleeping around and the other pills were to keep you quite presentable and by the way the boss is coming to dinner. <laughs> I wish I could wake you from what turned out to be a dumb dream so you could drive to work and take your seat at the boardroom table. To all those who felt the need to inject their faces with disease to feel young, who broke their own noses, cut their own skin, or made themselves sick in the name of thin, I wish you already felt beautiful. I wish I could swoop down with my mirror the size of the sky and show you what your children see. To those weak mothers that didn't protect their daughters from backhands, leather belts, or turning midnight doorknobs, I wish I could strengthen you. I wish I could shield satin's rings to protect every woman who was ever just taken from the street. I wish I had that power. To those who burned with purpose, only to be told their jobs are to be strictly mothers, wives, cooks, and cleaners. To those who still aren't allowed an education, who have to read books in secret and undertake clandestine classes. I wish I could build you a castle for a school, complete with silver soldiers to protect your beautiful minds. To those told to swallow ambition or to stick to be supportive, or to those who tried and were laughed away or who succeeded and were jeered and insulted and held to different standards, hounded out of positions of power. I wish I could arch my back in the ocean and push up islands in the sea beneath your bobbing chaff bags so you could climb out and start new and better worlds or at least try and fail like anybody else. I wish I could stretch out my Amazon river of a spine, sail you to these islands across cultures, lands, tribes, generations, religions and aeons so we could talk, lace our hearts together to form a bridge so long it reaches all the way to the next generation. So they know whatever happens, they have us. They can tap into this giant pulsating wisdom at any moment that they are never alone. And when they hear people say that all girls are bitches, or that women can't work together, or they're too emotional to be CEOs, or their life has no value simply because they were born female, they'll laugh. They'll laugh because they'll know about this crazy ancient heart bridge thing. I wish I could hurl myself back in time to the first season, to the debut episode, and let the girl with the apple know that folk are going to try and make out that she was an add-on accessory to Adam. Folk are going to say that she's a slave and not a creator, that her job was to serve man, not God, or the God that man decided. I want her to be strong. Show her daughters there's no need to ever be afraid. I wish there was no need to ever be 
afraid. To all the women who ever existed over the entire span of human history, I wish you knew I'm sorry.